I'm Mike Perham, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, and we welcome you to tonight's uh, program. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that tonight we have Dr. Yazal Lee, who's a professor of history and the Don Benson Dowd Chair in International Studies at the University of Central Oklahoma, and also an adjunct uh, professor at Norwich University. He received his doctorate from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh in 1991, and he is the editor of the Chinese Historical Review and editorial advisory board member of the Journal of Military History. He's a special lecturer, for he is our first lecturer ever to have served in the People's Liberation Army from, in China, and brings tonight's uh, talk an extensive background in the PLA and its history. He has published 14 books on the PLA, and his military history focused works in, include the Dragon in the Jungle, the Chinese Army in Vietnam 2020, Attack on Chosen, the Chinese Second Offensive in Korea, also written or published in 2020, China's War in Korea, Strategic Culture and Geopolitics, 2019, Building Ho's Army, Chinese Military Assistance to North Vietnam, published in 2019 also, and China's Battle for Korea, the Spring Offensive, 1951 in 2014. Uh, he's a very busy uh, a writer and a, and a very busy professor, and we're very pleased to have him here to talk tonight about Attack at Chosen, the Chinese Second Offensive in Korea, uh, which is a topic that typically is approached by the U.S. perspective, uh, looking at the, the Marines and the Army units uh, up during that battle. This is the first time I've had a perspective, really, uh, from the Chinese Army's perspective. So, Dr. Bing, the floor is now yours. Right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, it's a great opportunity to share my research uh, with your audience at the U.S. Army Center for Education. Uh, today, I like to uh, share my recent book. As Mike mentioned here, Chinese attack at Chosan, uh, the second offensive campaign of the Chinese volunteer army in November, December, 1950. This is one of my uh, recent publications on the POA or People's Liberation Army, uh, which I served in China during the 1970s. Uh, this book, Attack at Chosan, is uh, published by University of Oklahoma Press in 2020. Uh, this book provides a Chinese perspective on the Battle of Chosan, explaining the reasons why Chinese army failed to, e to reach his uh, war objective at Chosan. Uh, we know the Korean War broke out on June 25th, 1950, when the North Korea attacked the South in middle September, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur landed American troops at Yinchuan and turned the war situation around. Thereafter, United Nations forces or UN forces uh, marched across the 38th parallel toward into uh, North Korea. At the beginning of October, Kim Il sin the leader of North Korea, asked Stalin for help. But the Soviet Union's leader, Joseph Stalin, was not ready for World War III over Korea. So Stalin sent a telegram to Mao Zedong 
the Chinese leader in Beijing asking China, sending the volunteer troops to save North Korea. So Chinese leader made decision on October 4th to send the Chinese troops to North Korea to push UN forces away from North Korea. Here's the map of uh, MacArthur's Home for Christmas campaign in November. Pretty much uh, two uh, directions in the west, 8th Army pushed toward Yalu River in the east a 10th Corps, including 1st Marine and 7th Infantry Division, moved toward north. So during this uh, critical time, China made decision to intervene in the Korean War. Mao Zedong made decision again on October 4th, and he organized the Chinese regular troops into a so-called voluntary force, it's the same as the regular troops in mid-October. On October 19, the first wave of uh, volunteer forces crossed the Yalu River. By late November, it's about 450,000 Chinese troops in North Korea. At that point, in November 1950, Mao's goal in the war was to drive the UN forces out of Korea. The reason for Mao's decision uh, included his uh, relationship with uh, Moscow. During his uh, visit of Stalin in December 1949, Stalin made it clear to Mao to share the responsibility in the international communist movement. When the Soviet Union preoccupied in the West, China now became a communist state after October 1949, should be responsible for the communist movement in East Asia by supporting the neighboring countries like Korea, Vietnam, Japan, and India. So Mao agreed in order to receive Soviet military and economic aid and receive Moscow's nuclear protection. Besides his uh, international consideration, Mao also believed that it could serve China's interest by sending troops to Korea. Okay, the first about the Chinese uh, security. After the founding of the People's Republic in October 1949, Chinese leader always worry about national security. How, how, how could you defend a large country with a backward military? Even today, pretty much, you know, Chinese leader always worry about the weak army's defense against a technologically superior military force like U.S. armed forces. So Mao came up with this classic idea about proactive defense, which was, it still is, to stop a possible foreign invasion outside China, to prevent 
invasion of China from happening. Like right now, there's a Korean war. Since Mao believed sooner or later, there will be a war between China and America. So now it's a good opportunity for Chinese government to stop United States in Korea to protect China. It's so-called proactive defense. Or according to Chinese military classics, in the art of war by Sun Tzu, winning the war without fighting battles. So now for Mao is winning a national defensive war without fighting in China, but fighting outside China. Now we're talking about South China Sea, that could be the future battleground between China and America, since the Chinese government believe that's a good place for the showdown in case anything wrong is not in China, but thousand miles away in the South China Sea. That's Mao's uh, miscalculation of the international and national security. And second, Mao overestimated Chinese military power. He believed he, the surprise and the secrecy would win him a victory in Korea. In order to drive UN forces out of Korea, Mao ordered Chinese army to destroy several UN divisions in their offensive campaign in November. Since Mao and many Chinese leaders believe that human factors, the fighting spirits, would, should overcome their fair power inferiority and lack of the air support. So from the very beginning, from top down, there was a miscalculation which led to the military disaster for Chinese army at Chosan, as well as at other places. So here is the Chinese borders in the Northeast sharing with North Korea. That's how to defend China. And later that happened again in the middle 1960s. When there was a Vietnam War, Mao think Americans coming again to China. That's why he sent troops to Vietnam in the 1960s to stop American invasion of China in Vietnam. And now the South China Sea. So after October 19, large number of Chinese troops move into uh, North Korea under the command of uh, Marshal Peng De Huai, who was commander in chief of the Chinese voluntary force. Now, Peng also made mistakes uh, regarding to the Battle of Chosan in November. Peng met Kim Il sung in October 1950, and Peng decided to launch a large-scale attack at UN forces in late November. So when Peng was planning his attack, he had a different calculation. He planned to use the best troops against worst enemy, including ROC divisions, division of uh, Republic of Korea. But he planned to use weakest forces, a new force against the best of UN forces. In this case, the first Marine. There's another classic in Chinese military history about the horse racing by Sun Bin. I'm not sure if you have ever heard about this story, 
this guy, Sun Bin, is a couple of generations after Sun Tzu. He win the horse racing all the time. People are surprised how, how, how you could win, you know, the horse racing since you have same horses as your opponents, as the other people. They are classic, they category their horses, first class, second class, and a third class. The best, medium, and the weakest link. So Sun Bin told his friend, Okay, that's the secret about my winning. Okay, I always use my weakest horses against the strongest opponent. Okay, the first class, everybody put on the first best. I use my third class. That's for sure, I, I'm going to lose the first round, but don't worry, okay. The second round, I will use my best against their second. And the last round, I will use my second against their third class. So I can win three, I can win two out of three. That's my secret. So Marshall Peng pretty much adopted this uh, military classic and used the best against worst. So he had uh, five armies in Korea for two months. He concentrated those five armies against eighth army and then sent the newly arrived ninth army group to Chosan. Okay, they just crossed the border uh, unprepared, uh, without experience, just sent them there against the first Marine. So that's the uh, plan or mistake of Marshall Peng. That's pretty much uh, guaranteed the failure of Chinese attack at Chosan. So he used his uh, five army in the 13th army group, experienced a Northern army, those uh, polar bears from Manchuria in the West against 8th Army, U.S. 8th Army, and then used the Southern Army, the 9th Group, to Chosan against 1st Marine and 7th Division. So that's the mistakes. And also in order to encircle and destroy UN divisions, Peng waited and waited wait until MacArthur push his forces further north into Chinese trap in order to circulate and destroy those divisions. But wasn't the case at Chosan. Here's the map of the second offensive campaign by the Chinese troops from November 25th to December 7th. Here's the two directions. You can see on the west, your left, okay, the 13th Army Group recovered Pingrong, attacked Yinchuan, and in the east, on your right, 9th Army Group attacked at Chosan Reservoir. Thirteenth Army Group entered Korea in October, month or two months earlier. They had experience against the rock divisions in late October and early November. Now they were ready for the large scale attack in November, late November. Kim Yu Sin also agreed with Peng's plan to attack UN forces, cross the front about 200 miles, all out attack, okay, to fulfill his dream to retake South Korea, which he failed early that uh, year before in K-1. 
excuse me, early that year, 1950. So unfortunately for the ninth group, from top down, the high command and the volunteer general headquarters planned a disaster for the ninth army group at Chosan from November 27 to December 6. Ninth army group was a, a large force, including 150,000 troops four infantry armies and 12 divisions under the command of uh, Song Shilun, General Song on the right next to Zhu De. Zhu De was the commander-in-chief of the People's Liberation Army at that time. Well, even though Mao made a strategic mistake and Peng planned his own horse racing, Song still had a chance. But again, unfortunately, Song did not make it because of his own miscalculation and mistakes. He decided to launch a surprise attack. And his attack included all the UN forces in the X Corps around the Chushan Reservoir, about the seven regiments, okay. four regiments from 1st Marine, two regiments from the seventh division, and another uh, regiment from other units. So attack them all at the same time. And also he ordered massive attack, okay, large scale attack, or what the usually called human wave attack. So those mistakes led to the failure of Chinese attack at Chosan. In order to surprise 10th Corps at Chosan to surprise General Smith, commander of the 1st Marine, soon ordered a concealed movement from the Yalu River to Chosan about 160 miles. They give up the major road. They did not use the railroad. Instead, 9th Army Group claimed the snow mountain to conceal their movement. Surprisingly, uh, the UN Air Renaissance did not discover the Chinese movement in the East they failed to report Chinese movement toward Chosan. In order to uh, move faster to reach uh, the surprise factor, Sun ordered his troops to leave their heavy artillery pieces behind along the Yalu River. So they only keep a small piece like 75 mm uh, rocket launchers and uh, mortars. Because of this uh, secrecy, uh, soon ordered soldiers carry on their own logistics, rationale and supplies. So maximum, each soldier only can carry uh, his own food for five to seven days. That's it. They need to carry four grenades, uh, 60 rounds of uh, rifle bullets, and five to seven day food for himself. So soon, the troops run out of the food on their march before they reach uh, Chosan. Here is the unit of a uh, Ninth Army Group cross the Gaima Mountain. Uh, during that uh, November, the weather was pretty cold, uh, 30 or 40 below zero. Uh, many soldiers suffered frostbite. Some of them uh, frozen to death during the march. You can tell from the map, the Western Front 
by the 13th Army Group closer to China. But the Eastern Front over Chosan Reservoir, 160, 180 miles away from the Yalu River. So it's hard to reach, hard to supply the 9th Army Group. So Sun's plan, surprise attack, actually uh, did not guarantee the victory for 9th Army Group. The second mistake by Sun Shilun's plan is to divide and destroy all the six regiments of UN forces around the Chosen Reservoir. According to Song's plan, his divisions should be able to cut off and circulate all the X Corps units, the 6th Regiment. His armies should be able to separate 1st Marine from the 7th Division. And the Chinese troops would launch attack at the same time at all the reg UN regiment during the night of uh, November 27. So that was the second mistake by General Song. So overstretched his uh, forces. Uh, here's the map. See. The first step separation and encirclement was successful. Chinese able to uh, corner UN units into a small pocket, okay. separate a 1st Marine Div uh, Regiment, 5th, 7th Div uh, Regiments at uh, Yungdan Ni, Hunguru Ri, and Koto Ri, and also separate 31st Regiment of uh, 7th Division and from 32nd Regiment in uh, Xinxing Ri. Okay. So the first step was uh, successful by the early morning of uh, November 28 to separate and cut off units but they failed to destroy those regiments. And next morning, next day, 28th, 29th, the Chinese regiments launched attack, but they failed. Okay. Those are so-called large scale attack didn't work. From time to time, from case to case, you can see many battalion size attack. 600 to 1,000 men at once charge a hill, charge a defense position, charge a company of a Marine. Because of the lack of a fair support, lack of air defense, the charging troops suffered casualties. So through 28, 29, two days, okay, soon division failed to destroy any of a UN units, not even a company. <laughs> Think about this, you know, you launch a battalion size attack cannot even destroy one American company. So many of the Chinese regiment suffered heavy casualties during the second and third day attack at those three locations, Yungdan Ri, Hengaru Ri, and Xinxin Ri. So the heavy casualties uh, impeded Chinese attack. After November 29th, uh, Chinese division would not be able to launch another major attack because of casualty. Look at number here, you see, for example, 58th Division, 20th Army, totaling 12,000 men. Okay, during two days attack, they lost 7,000 men. 
And day later, by November 30, the entire division had only 1,500 able-bodied soldiers. That's all they left. No way they launched another major attack. Another example here at Xinxingri against 31st Regiment, that the regiment of 80th Army D Division, total 3,600 men on November 27. By November 29, two days later, 300 able men left in one regiment. So after 29th, General Song Shilun made the change of his war plan shifted from attacking all the units to focusing on one regiment, 31st Regiment of 7th Division. Soon readjusted his plan and attacked one regiment only, 31st Regiment of 7th Division. So after November 30, the first Marine broke out Chinese uh, circlement and moved toward south. Soon's efforts of uh, pursuit and the roadblock also failed. So 9th Army failed the goal to destroy 1st Division and 7th Division and Chosan. 9th Army Group suffered heavy casualties, about 80,000 casualties, including 48 combat casualties, 29,000 non-combat, 4,000 missing in action. The Army Group liquidated three divisions. On December 15, Mao recalled Army Group back to China. So the heavy casualties became one of the major reasons forced Song Shilun to stop his plan at Chosen Reservoir. During this uh, November offensive campaign, uh, Mao's only son Mao Anying also was killed on November 25th, 1950, during an air raid by UN Air Force. As we know, Chosan uh, Reservoir as a classic battle, as many as American historians uh, concluded the reason for the Chinese failures from a American perspective resulted from the superior UN firepower, tactical close air support, combat effectiveness of the US Marine and infantry troops, uh, logistics and airlift during the Battle of Chosan. The reason the Chinese perspective has change from to time to time. Now the reason perspectives are critical uh, against Mao's uh, calculation, and also believe the Chinese generals, including both Peng Dehuai and Song Shilun, uh, made mistakes. At the division level, the troops had problems in their foreign war and they were unprepared and did not receive sufficient supply. During the Battle of uh, Chosan, uh, many Chinese soldiers were captured by the UN forces. During the truce negotiation from 51 to 53, many Chinese soldiers uh, did not want to 
be repatriated back to China, 70% of the Chinese soldiers, Chinese POWs, 70% of Chinese prisoners of war decided to go to Taiwan. When I interviewed President Ma Yingjiu in Taiwan, Ma was the president of the uh, Republic of China and Taiwan from 2008 to 2016. I interviewed him in 2017. He believed uh, the POW issues engaged Taiwan in the Cold War. Thereafter, America re recognized strategic importance of Taiwan after 1953. And then US government signed mutual defense treaty with Taiwan in 1954, which uh, made commitment to the safety and security of Taiwan. So Taiwan survived the Cold War because of Korea. And now, Korean War became a hot topic in China. Uh, from top down, President Xi Jinping made an important speech last October, October 23rd, 2020, and mentioned Chinese sacrifice in Korea, and Korean War was never forgotten in China. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll now open it up for questions. If folks want to uh, place the questions onto the question and answer icon uh, on your screen, I, I will then pass them uh, to Professor Ving. Uh, I'd like to start with the, the first one. Uh, what, you, what are your sources and how easy were you able to get access to some of these Chinese military records? Well, that, that's a, a, a good question, Mike. It's a, pretty hard to get uh, official documents in a communist state like China. Um, but now, since uh, uh, 2016, there was a disagreement between Beijing and Pyongyang. Beijing began to complain North Korea, which, you know, forgot, uh, ignored, and dismissed sacrifice of the Chinese efforts in the Korean War. So officially, Beijing began to open some uh, archives to show, you know, like those casualties, you know, the photos, uh, how much uh, China paid, you know, one million casualties in the Korean War uh, to put blame back on North Korea. And more and more generals, retired generals and veterans, uh, able and willing to talk about their uh, experience in Korea. So I had about over 100 uh, interviews with uh, veterans in China, both in China and in Taiwan. You know, those, those, those uh, 14,000 POWs in Taiwan, I also interviewed some of them in Taiwan. So uh, personal interviews, declassified documents and uh, army history, uh, history books in military academies also provided some of the sources for my research. Okay, uh, this uh, next question is from Corey. Corey wants to know why is there a revival in the interest of the Korean War within China? What caused that revival of interest? Uh, revival of the re relations or what? What? Why is all of a sudden the Korean War a important topic in China? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, because of the uh, change of China's uh, status in East Asia. So before nineteen nineties, you know, Japan as a you know leader in East Asia and, but now after 2000 and 2010, China believe, you know, is the uh, leader in East Asia. So to uh, 
argued his uh, power status, Korean War became a very important case uh, for the Chinese government uh, to make such an uh, argument to see this uh, could be other way uh, to handle international affairs in East Asia. Korea was the case for Chinese government to judge uh, his today's behavior. Okay, we're not aggressive, not insertive, you know, because we were forced to do many things like Korea and Vietnam, Taiwan. We didn't want to, but if you don't, you will face the consequence. So they use the history to judge their uh, new policy today. Uh, this question is from Rodney. Uh, did the leading Chinese generals in Korea suffer personal consequences as a result of the poor performance of the soldiers and of the campaign? Yes, yes. Uh, some commanders faced a uh, court martial. Uh, three battalion commanders was executed uh, after this November campaign. So the commanders uh, at all the levels uh, faced uh, a failed attack. Okay. Because at that time, no Mao, neither Peng, no Song uh, took the rest of responsibility. So any mistakes or failed attack uh, should go to the individual commander at lower level. So some of them took the rest of the responsibility, yes. So the, so the big bosses got our way okay, but the, the lower level bosses <laughs> got in trouble, right? Okay. Right, yes. Yeah. Um, question, what, uh, before I go to the next uh, one that's been written, what happened to many of the POWs that returned to China? Were they uh, treated okay or were they uh, punished? No, they were not. <laughs> so they regretted they should go to Taiwan because, you know, <clears throat> That wasn't you know, just a communist government, but uh, traditionally Chinese did not respect prisoners. Okay, you should fight to death. Okay, so during the training, part of the Chinese army's training, they you know they train how to use, you know, the last grenade or bullet to finish yourself. Okay. But, but, but now in the Vietnam War, they give you a suicide bomb, they put on your collar here, you can push it or, you know, or, or, or bite it, explore to finish yourself rather than be captured. In that was not a Vietnam War, okay, that was war between China and Vietnam in 1979. Okay. Still today, China still trained the soldier to die rather than be captured. So prisoners pretty much as a traitor uh, since you gave up. And uh, so many of them uh, dismissed, they lost their pension. They were criticized as an anti-revolutionary. Also their family uh, took the blame as well. So their experience until 19, late 1980s, finally Beijing issued uh, documents to recognize the prisoners of war in Korea. Think about 30 years later, they were not bad guy. Okay, those prisoners is okay. And then they began to pay back the compensation about $3 a week. So really not that much, but they were so happy since they were rehabilitated and then they can get rid of the, uh, the bad name on the prisoners. This question comes from Robert. Uh, no, let me drop one. For By first from Byron. Did battlefield issues at Chosen, the lack of air power, play a role in bringing Soviet Union pilots into the air war uh, to fight against UN air, uh, UN and US uh, air superiority? So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that, that was the uh, part of the deal. Stalin agreed. Uh, to provide air uh, coverage in North Korea. 
So Soviet Union sent to China 12 uh, air divisions uh, to provide air coverage for the Chinese operation uh, in North Korea, pretty much about 80 miles north of 38 parallel. So that's about 160 miles. So Soviet Air Force covered half of the North Korea, what's it called, a uh, meager alley, yeah. 80 miles. So that was a uh, played an important role. Uh, Soviet Air Force lost about 300 pilots uh, during the Korean War. Were you able to find documentary evidence of correspondence between uh, China, North Korea, and the Soviet Union, or, or is it just based more on, on what actually happened? Yeah, there were some documents after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s. Uh, Yersin presented South Korea some documents about the Korean War. Uh, Wuju Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. translated some of those uh, Russian documents into English, and they uh, digitalized those uh, Russian documents uh, in America available for the research. Many of documents related to the Russian Air Force activity in the Korean War. Uh, the next question is from Robert. He asks, uh, in by July of 1951, when China and North Korea agreed to go negotiate uh, with the UN forces at, K at Kaesong, um, it was obvious that the war was going into a stalemate. Why did Mao and Stalin drag out the war for another two years? Did you find any reason why in, in documents or in interviews? Uh-huh. Yeah, Stalin was uh, happy to see the American bleeding in Korea so did not intend to uh, end the war without a better position. Mao shared Stalin's view and uh, continued the war efforts. Uh, and Mao always believed, even though he uh, addressed his goal, okay, from driving UN force out of Korea to defending the North Korea. So that's why it's a uh, stay, remain, along the 38 parallel, but the Mao continued to fight, uh, believed that could uh, provide time and uh, favorable condition for the Communist Party in China to control domestic issues. You have a foreign war, so the Communist Party could establish authority in China through the three years. Okay, so uh, Mao believed China is a beneficial victor in the Korean War. Uh, this question comes from, from Doug. He wants to know, what could have the Chinese done to win this campaign? Is there anything, or was the UN firepower so much overwhelming? The uh, Chinese uh, second campaign, or? Yeah, what, what could have they have done? What, if you've looked at this campaign, what could they have changed? Uh, could they have slowed the attack down in the east to bring up their supplies? Was, was there any discussion of what would have made the campaign successful? Well, just like we uh, discussed here, uh, Mao could uh, narrow down his goal. Instead of driving the UN out of Korea, he could, you know, had a plan to focus on certain issues or a certain part of the world. As a poem, he should not, you know, launch the all-out attack along the 120 miles front. He could concentrate forces on part of the 8th Army or 10th Corps soon as well. So they were uh, overestimated Chinese military power. So that, that, that's the first. And uh, the second is that uh, uh, so supply and the logistics became a major issue. China should uh, prepare better for such a large scale foreign war. And uh, the third, they should change, but they still be believed today, you know, believe the man better than machine. <laughs> they believe uh, a soldier better than technology. So they should know better believe in firepower, you know, artillery tanks and uh, 
uh, Firepower should emphasize on the technology uh, more objective to human factors. Um, were there any U.S. If you go to the National Archives, or any, is there anywhere in the United States that if somebody wanted to see uh, some of the uh, interviews done with POWs, Chinese POWs, it, have you ever found holdings in the United States where those interviews may be recorded or, or preserved? Not a lot. There's a little bit, you know, during the, uh, they call it a screening. Right. So for the voluntary repatriation, the third party, not American, not Chinese, but some reps from India, Poland, to interview the, all the prisoners, the Chinese prisoners. Where do you want to go? What do you believe? What would you like to, you know, go? Taiwan, Bay, China, Korea. So they have some of the records of the interviews, uh, but not a, a, a whole a lot. But there is a book uh, by David Cheng titled Hijacked War, published last year by Stanford University, uh, provide a lot of uh, in interviews. But the uh, Taiwanese government documented an uh, individual oral history project about the six volume. After the 14,000 Chinese prisoners went to Taiwan, they interviewed all of them and uh, compiled uh, books. So that could be a good sources in Taiwan in Chinese for the prisoner's experience. So you think there's the, still the opportunity to do a significant amount of research from the Chinese perspective on the Korean War? Yes, of course. Yeah, now still, you know, we're talking about the generals, <laughs> but we still the lack of the, you know, booth on the ground. What about, you know, John? What about, you know, uh, Jackie Chen? You know, those individual soldiers experience still not there. Not that much. Um, so the, my next program, you know, could be oral history or individual history, look at the individual soldier story, uh, not just generals, officers, but uh, uh, at the corporals and private, their experience in the war. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, we, have, we have no more questions. Do you have any closing remarks uh, about how uh, we can gain from reading your books because they're not just uh, about uh, uh, China. You, you also look at Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, are there any lessons they can draw from, uh, from both those wars and what you've done on research? Well, I, I just feel like, you know, there's a, a lot about the Chinese army. So conventional will or popular conclusions about the People's Liberation Army, oh, that's Communist Army, Party's Army, just the tool, instrument of party, but actually it was not that simple. So the Chinese army has its own culture, tradition. So this is a lot, lot of uh, characteristics and uh, uh, tradition of the army should be studied since, you know, we're going to talk about the possible conflicts later on. So the army has his own uh, uh, tradition and history. We should pay more attention to the Chinese army itself instead of to Chinese party's policy. Okay. What was it like being a young soldier in the, in the, uh, the PLA? Well, right now they are... Uh, <laughs> what was your experience? Uh, 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 promised the uh, uh, education, uh, city jobs. So now the service became a, a social opportunity for social mobility. So if you are a country boy, you are a farmer's son, you want to go to the city, you want to get a better job, go to college, join the army. So. That's a, they also start some program just like ROTC here in America to attract. Uh, since they had a problem to recruit uh, the soldiers, we got one child policy. Nobody want to give up their only son, you know, to army. 
So the army tried pretty hard to recruit uh, the new soldiers. And uh, now it's more and more uh, urban uh, youth uh, willing to join uh, the military. Be before, so mostly it's from the rural, remote areas, minorities, you know, ethnics, and, but now more urban youth join the army as well. So as uh, Xi Jinping mentions, they uh, try to develop a technology intensive army, uh, army able to fight, able to win, not just defense, but also in offensive campaigns. So uh, the new leader in Beijing uh, invested heavily in the military in recent years. You can tell from their annual defense budget, you know, increase in the double digit. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, investment. So the technology training uh, improvement uh, became important. Now, did you come from the uh, rural or urban areas when you uh, went into the army? I was uh, in the rural areas. Okay. I, I was in Manchuria. So that was in 1970s. And uh, I, I was born in Beijing, but uh, after the Cultural Revolution, probably you're familiar with that, Mike. So those uh, Red Guards, the students uh, were sent to uh, remote areas like Manchuria. I was one of the millions was sent to Manchuria and no future, no education, joining the army. Uh, again, back then, still the opportunity. So I joined the People's Liberation in 1971. Well, and, and now you're a college professor. So it, 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 it <laughs> you know, uh, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, we have one more question that seemed to pop up while we were chatting here. Um, this is from Robert again. Did you learn anything from Peng's forced confession of the history of the Chinese war in the 1960s when he was under arrest and being beaten by the Red Guard? Are you familiar with the, his forced confession? confession? Uh, whose con con confession you mean? In uh, Peng Diao. Oh, oh, yes, Peng, Peng Dehuai. Yeah. Peng's confession. He, yes, yeah, he became a victim of the power struggle in 1959. So Marshal Peng, the defense minister, was dismissed from his uh, positions and uh, was jailed for a while. So during the jail time, he wrote, you know, c confession uh, about his uh, military career but he confessed several mistakes uh, in his military career. Some of the mistakes uh, took place during the Korean War. He uh, admitted he made mistakes during the Korean War. Yes, yeah, I read his uh, con confession, yes. Well, again, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. I think there might be some other opportunities, especially with uh, looking at the uh, the Chinese support uh, of uh, developing Ho Chi Minh's army. I think there might be an interest on that, so I might come back to you again for another talk in the future, if that's okay. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, and have a great night. We we'll talk thank soon. You, thank okay. you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.